Newt Rockney is the most revered football coach for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish in history and arguably the greatest college football coach of all time. In 122 games that he coached, he lost 12 games. He has the highest winning percentage of any coach ever. However, his 1928 football season was his worst. The team finished at 5-4, and four, which means that over his other eight 12 years, he lost eight games in 12 years. But on November 10th, 1928, during that abysmal year for him, November 10th lives on in college football lore. It was a contest between Notre Dame and Army at Yankee Stadium, just like happened yesterday. And like yesterday, Army was undefeated, but Notre Dame was 4-4. Four and four. At halftime, Rockney told his players the story of the tragic death of George Gipp, the star halfback that passed away in 1920. And as legend goes, Gipp was in the hospital bed when Rockney came to visit him. And he asked Rockney, someday in the future, would the team win just one for the Gipper? So on that day at halftime, Rockney used the story to rally his underdog troops to a 12-6 victory against the Black Knights of West Point. In the film, Newt Rockney, Gipper, played by the former President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, said it like this, I've got to go, Rock, but it's all right. I'm not afraid. Sometime, Rock, when the team is up against it, when the things are wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, ask them to go in there with all they've got and win just one for the Gipper. This is regarded by many as the greatest halftime speech in history. And it's good, but it's definitely not the best. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, if ever there was a time when the disciples needed a pep talk, if ever there was a time where they needed a halftime speech, it was this night. On the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, the notorious location of Jesus' unjustified arrest and the beginning of his illegal evening, filled with trials and trumped up charges and an undeserved death sentence. Put yourself in the sandals of Peter, James, John, Philip. Phil fill their emotion, see it from their eyes. What's already transpired in this evening, they are in need of encouragement. We're going to pick up in John chapter 16, verse 5. Well, really, verse 4b. And then we're going to read through the end. So hang in there. Bear with me. This is the word of the living God. John chapter 16, picking up in the middle of verse 4. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment... Because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while. And you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And so some of the disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Because I am going to the Father? So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you're asking yourselves? What I mean by saying, A little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, 
for your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she's sorrow because of her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy in a human being that has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and I've come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and you do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, there's a lot in this text. But hopefully, even in the reading, you will see why I decided, instead of having this week and next week, to bring it all together under one sermon, because this entire text is structured around three significant and unified statements, one at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. In verse 6, he talks about sorrow has filled their heart. In verse 20, their sorrow will be turned into joy. And in verse 33, that they will have peace and take heart. This is a text of encouragement. This is Jesus' final pep talk to the disciples. This is the greatest halftime speech in all of history. In the middle of the game, it looks like the disciples are losing, and it looks like Jesus is um, going to be overcome, and he gives them, as his last words to them, four reasons that they are going to win, and win convincingly. Four reasons that they are going to win, and win convincingly. Now, before we get into those, you really see verses 5 through 7 serve as an introduction to Jesus' claim. He makes an observation regarding the disciples. He says, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask where you're going, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. This is not in a vacuum. If you'll recall, we've been talking about this context. He's he's talked about the fact that he's going to leave, that persecutions are coming, and the hour is coming. And look at verse 5. He says, I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask, where are you going? Have you ever experienced that when people ask you that question, but they're really not concerned about where you're going? They're just concerned that you're leaving. This happens often as a parent, sometimes as a spouse, where they say, hey, where are you going? Right? Or maybe you're doing something together and you get up to leave, you're playing a game, or you're doing something, or you're working and someone starts to leave, and they say, hey, where are you going? They don't really care where you're going. They care the fact that you left. That's what's going on with the disciples here. They're not concerned They're not really asking in depth, where are you going? They are just bothered by the fact that he's talking about leaving. After all this talk of persecution, his departure affects them greatly. I want you to understand it's not just anyone that's leaving them. It's not just one of the disciples. It's not as if, okay, Judas left, now another leaves. That leaves us only 10. Our team's getting smaller. That's what concerns us. No, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, is leaving him, is leaving them. The one that in the middle of a hurricane-like situation on the Sea of Galilee was able to stand up and speak and the waters were stilled and the wind subsided. The one who could touch a lame man and make him leap. The one who could give sight to the blind. The one who could feed thousands of people with a boy's lunchbox. This is the one that is leaving them. They did understand that Jesus had power that they could not comprehend. They did understand that Jesus was different than anyone else they'd ever known. And this Jesus is now walking away from them, saying, you're about to face persecution, and I'm leaving. So, verse 6 is almost self-explanatory. I've said these things to you, because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. 
Now again, this is why we brought this whole section of chapter 16 together under one sermon is because four times this word is used in chapter 16. It's used nowhere else in the New Testament. Sorrow, this overwhelming grief and sadness is consuming them. Deep-seated disappointment, a sense of isolation. And the structure indicates that it's an effect that on is ongoing. What's so sweet here is that Christ understands that unless these disciples gain a different perspective, they will not only lose morale, but possibly the will to continue it all. He's not cold or indifferent to his absence. He's not cold or indifferent to their dismay. But he tends to them in this text. But notice carefully how he tends to them. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. And I want to pause and just tell you that there is no comfort apart from the truth. Now, don't take that wrongly. That doesn't mean you have to always tell everyone every truth that you see. Okay? You understand that? That sort of a perennial question, does this dress make me look fat? You are not obligated. Under the loving paradigm of God, you're not obligated to communicate truth in those moments. Do you understand me? Okay? That question... That, that's, that's, off the, that's not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about here is if you try to come to someone in their problems, in their sins, and you try to convince them with something other than the truth, if you try to soothe their conscience with something other than the truth, you're not helping them. It would be like a doctor that gives an, an easier diagnosis just to make the patient feel more comfortable. That is not true comfort. That is deception and destruction. The true comfort only comes from the truth. So Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. And then he says these words, it is to your advantage. Or some translations, it is far better for you. It is to your advantage that I go. You want me to stay, but how short-sighted you are. What you want is actually not good for you. And again, this takes us to that toddler mindset. They cannot see beyond what's right in front of them. They can't see beyond the day. The disciples, like the disciples in this room, are often too caught up in what is immediate, what is temporal. We lean on our own understanding. What is your immediate reaction to bad news? What is your immediate reaction to your plans being thwarted or your aspirations going unmet? Sadness, grief, anger, depression... How quickly do we second-guess God's plan? And then we find ourselves like Job in Job 42 when he hears the words, Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Who are we? Who are we to think that we know what is good for us in the long run? In the, who are we? We can't, even control, we can't even control what is right in front of us in the moment. And yet we question the one who is over all and above all and created all and has always been good to his children. I think the question that we need to ask is how many times has he failed you? He's never failed these 11 and he's never failed you. But to these 11, in that moment, despite all that God has done for them, despite all that God had put on display for them, these 11 could not think that there would be anything further from what is good for them than Christ leaving them. He had already explained to them that in his departure, he was going to prepare a place for them through salvation. He was going to enable them to do greater works. He was going to impart richer knowledge for them and comfort them with the presence of the Holy Spirit. He had already told them all of this, and yet they were short-sighted and self-centered and could not see. And so the first pep in this pep talk as Jesus tells them why it is better for them, for him to leave, number one, they will receive a heavenly transfer. A heavenly transfer. In college athletics, to the chagrin of many in this room, uh, we have come to a position where there is a transfer, transfer portal. If you're not happy in your current place, you can put your name in a hat and you can transfer to another college. Sadly, only the very upper echelons of athletes ever find a home. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85% of athletes that put their name in their hat. I'm disgruntled here. I'm going to go to a better place. I'm the fourth string wide receiver here. I'll definitely start at Alabama. Let me put my name in the hat. And they didn't recruit me the first time, but they'll definitely recruit me now because who's not looking for a disgruntled fourth string wide receiver? Most of them never find their home, but the elite ones do. 
Here's what I want you to understand. Some good teams will grab great players through this transfer portal, and this is what Jesus is explaining to them. My departure doesn't mean an absence of me. It actually means the addition of the Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. All right, what's the big deal about this helper, this Holy Spirit? What is it that he will provide? And I think Jesus lists at least four of the attributes that he will bring, four of his talents that he's bringing to the team. First is this, he will convict of sin and judgment. When he comes, verse 8, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Then he goes on to expand concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I want you to hear this. The Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin. Now, this isn't in the same sense that it's not as if the Holy Spirit is taking the role of the prosecutor and that he is standing and judging in this sense. He's not saying, you know, you, you know, you committed the code red. He's not standing there like this. What he is standing there doing is he is calling people to recognize their sin and to repent. That's the kind of conviction that the Holy Spirit is bringing. He's bringing conviction of sin. Now, we need to understand that our world denies sin as, a, as an entity in and of itself. At the very least, it downplays it. You're not supposed to talk about it. You're certainly you're not supposed to preach about it. Sin? That's, that doesn't bring people through the doors. Don't tell people they're sinners. It's exactly what the Holy Spirit does, is he will convict of sin. And we know that. We have in us a a conscience that calls us out and that convicts us, but over time we suppress the truth because of our desire for our own unrighteousness. And yet the Holy Spirit will convict and show sin. It will show that our righteousness is wanting and that we stand under judgment. It will point out to us that it is appointed for man wants to die. We will notice as we get older and older that death is coming and no one has outlived it or outrun it. Death is certain and with death comes judgment and the Holy Spirit will put that conviction on mankind. He will bring conviction and judgment but in that he brings grace and mercy and the promise of salvation. The Holy Spirit quickens people. It makes them alive. It makes them recognize not only is their sin damning, but their Savior is merciful. And that while they stand condemned, they can run to Jesus and find salvation and forgiveness in the cross. God's righteousness is fulfilled in Christ and His Spirit will put that on display. He not only convicts of sin, He guides the saints in truth. Look at verse 13. Oh, well, verse 12 is an interesting verse. I'll just have to put this in. This is briefly. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. <clears throat> have you ever been in that moment where you're in a classroom or you're in a situation and there's just a lot coming and all of a sudden everything just shuts off and everything's being said? It's just, or maybe you've seen it in the eyes of your children or you've seen it in the eyes of a coworker or someone that you're trying to instruct and you can just tell you're done. The, the, water, the water's full and overflowing. I'm not getting anything else in anymore. Jesus knows that the disciples have met their end at this point. They they can't take in any more. And so he says, that's okay. I'm leaving the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will begin to add more. He will bring more of what I have to say to you. And he will also remind you of the things that you will so quickly forget. Even some of the most elementary teachings that they've received will need to be reinforced and re-explained and clarified because they cannot bear them now. They are maxed out. But the Holy Spirit will come and guide you. The text says, in all truth, this picture of guide you is the same image that's described in 1 Peter 5, that elders in the church, pastors in the church are to shepherd. Uh, They're to lead, not to drive. And the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. John 14 tells us that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. And I love the fact that Jesus puts this very clearly. We could have a whole study on the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in this text because he shows that the Spirit, while serving the Son and the Father is co-equal with the Son and the Father. They have distinct roles, but the same worth and value. He says the Holy Spirit will communicate the same. He will declare the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
All that the Father has is mine, and therefore that I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. It is the same message. The Father's message is the Son's message, it is the Spirit's message, and he will guide the saints in that truth. Not only convict and guide, but the Holy Spirit will also declare. He will declare what is to come, the text says. He will give the disciples not only prophetic words that they will write down about the future. We think about this particular apostle. You think about John writing the book of Revelation. But it also will tell them what is taking place, what is the truth behind what takes place in the future for them, but in the past for us. In other words, the Holy Spirit will help explain the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. And you can then write it and pin it to the world. The reality is this, the Holy Spirit brings truth, and truth brings comfort. Spurgeon once said this, the more you know of God's truth, all else being equal, the more comfortable you will be as a Christian. Is that not truly the case? You deal with calamity because of the truth of a sovereign God. You deal with injustice because of the truth that it will all be made right one day. You deal with trials because of the truth that it matures believers and because God loves us. You deal with suffering because it was ordained, but because of the truth that it was ordained by God, it has a beginning, it has an end, and it's all according to his purposes. Truth comforts, and the Holy Spirit brings truth. So friends, when sorrow fills your heart, let Scripture fill your mind and ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of the truths that will comfort you. The fourth and final quality that Jesus leaves of this heavenly transfer is found in verses 14 to 16. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And again, pause. We could go off on a whole theological discourse here. If you ever want to know uh, a unique place, somebody comes knocking on your door and says, hey, you want to talk to you about Jesus? And no, I don't really think Jesus is God. Here's a unique place that most people won't go to. But this is a place where Jesus says, I will be glorified. And the scriptures say that only one can be glorified. There is only one God under heaven. There is or over heaven. There is only one God in all the world. And he alone is the one worthy of glory. And so for Jesus to say it is good and right for you to glorify me, he is equating himself with the Father. But that's for another message. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is going to declare the words of Christ to the world. And again, the Father and the Spirit and the Son are in one accord. This is the good news of the heavenly transfer. It is incredible, but there's more. Not only is there a heavenly transfer, but his second encouragement in this pep talk, he predicts a turnover is coming. A turnover is coming. And in football, a turnover is a game changer. It's a momentum swing. You know, the defense has the ball. I mean, the defense is is protecting their goal line. The offense has the ball. If you're on defense, you may even be backpedaling. You're trying everything you can. You're in this posture. And then all of a sudden, there's a turnover, and everything swings. The momentum swings. The stadium roars because everything has turned from bad to good. Here in this moment, the disciples are on their heels. They're backpedaling. They're trying, trying not to give in. And then all in one evening, if you can just imagine, again, what they've been going through, think about how many blows they have taken just this evening alone. Think about all the threats that they are they, they're, they're essentially watching film about the game they're getting ready to play, and they're becoming more and more terrified about all that's coming after them. So I want to pick up and reread this, verse 16. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does it mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. I love this. They know that Jesus is saying he's going away, but what does it mean, this whole little while? What exactly is Jesus talking about? What is he describing? And I think it's helpful for us to understand that he is describing a departure and a return. So what is it? Is it when he goes to the, to the heavens and when he returns here to the earth in the future? I don't think that's what's taking place here. I think what is taking place is the very encouragement that's going to be Jesus is going to leave them through death and he's going to return to see them through resurrection. You can think about how difficult this would be, though, how confusing this would be for the disciples who have no category for a dying Messiah. They're unable to process it all. They're in this sort of thick fog. Jesus' departure to us makes perfect sense, but to those 11, it was nonsense. It was absurd. You cannot grasp the truth behind this text until you truly grasp the grave state of the 
disciples in their hearts. Morale's at an all-time low. Jesus knows they are giving up ground. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, and so he said, is this what you were saying? What do you mean? A little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, you will see me? And then verse 20, Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. So in other words, he's saying, it is going to look like we're losing. You're going to weep and you're going to lament. And oh, how they will weep and lament at the death of Christ. And it will look like the world is winning. And the world will rejoice. You will wrongly see that the death of Christ is a final defeat. You see, friends, on this side of the cross, the cross was not a pleasant thing. No one was wearing cross earrings or a cross necklace. No one had a cross tattoo, right? This was not... The cross was a symbol of shame and execution. In fact, today even, I think it might be more helpful, and I've I've sort of implored some of you, you creative types, to come up with a jewelry line uh, that is an artistic line that is centered around an empty tomb. Maybe that's more difficult to come up with. I don't know, conceptually. But anyway, that's where we live. We live in the fact that the tomb is empty. We're on the other side of the cross, but not the disciples. The disciples are sitting here looking at the death of a Messiah as the end Of course they will weep and they will lament and the world will rejoice because the world knows this is the the demons knew that Jesus was the threat. And so when he's dying on the cross, think about the rejoicing, think about the, the celebration, the early celebration, but the celebration that's taking place. This is the hard reality. But then Jesus brings the truth of the turnover. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Your sorrow will turn into joy. Take note of the wording. He doesn't say that the sorrow will be replaced with joy. It will be turned into joy. The sorrow won't be masked with joy. It will turn into joy. Now, here's why this is important. This is not something bad happens and then you, you know, your, your child gets hurt and you give them candy or ice cream and you're trying to mask that or disguise that or distract that. That's not the case. It's actually the very thing that is causing them sorrow will be the thing that brings them joy. How do we know that? Look at his illustration. Verse 21. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that human being has been born into the world. Pain of childbirth is real, is it not? Come on, that should have been the easiest amen I ever get. (laughs) Right? Pain of childbirth is real? Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and excruciating and all these adjectives that I could give. Yet, right? Yet, there are many of you in this room who have more than one child. Why? Because this truth, this elementary and earthly and temporal truth is a great picture of Christ's resurrection. It is that the joy of what comes through the pain is so far greater than the pain that the pain can be forgotten. The, the pain can be endured. Because of the joy that's before us. None of you sign up for childbirth with no baby at the end. None of you sign up for that, right? That's why it's such a a devastating blow. That's why miscarriages and stillborns and and infant deaths, that's why it's such a blow to us. Because you don't go through that pain without the joy at the end. And yet, those of you that have gone through that, how many times have I heard from the words of them just months later? All right, I, I could do another. Do you remember the conversation we've heard from you time and time again? About the stories. In fact, I have a friend that says if you, give, if you give mothers 20 minutes together, they're going to end up start telling birth stories. It won't take just 20 minutes. You give them time in a room, and that's what's going to happen. Because it's a ridiculous thing that you go through. And yet the joy so far outweighs the pain that you're willing to do it again and again. And some of you again and again and again and again. <laughs> Praise God for you. Yes, the pain that you will feel when I die on the cross will be real. The sorrow and the anguish will be real, but it will turn into joy. The very death that I die, he's saying to them, will be the cause of your joy. It's not just a distraction. We're not just going to drown you with something else. We are going to look at the very pain is the source of your joy. Now, I want you to know something here. He, 
he gets to a place in this text that I want this to sit and marinate on us. Verse 22, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. And friends, they did rejoice when they saw him. It said when they tested and they saw the, the scars in his hands and his feet, it says the disciples rejoiced. But listen to this line. No one will take your joy from you. This is the result of the resurrection. The world and the devil will take a lot of things from you. The world and the devil can take a lot of things from you. It can take your job or your promotion, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your retirement, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your wealth and your riches, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your health, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your influence or your fame or your hopes of those, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your reputation. It can smear your name, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your freedom, your illustrious, your glorious freedom of being here in America, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your loved ones from you, but it cannot take your joy. It can take your life, but it cannot take your joy. This is the truth that we have as Christians the joy that we have, the true joy that we have is untouchable by the world, the flesh, or the devil. You have access to joy that can't be touched, to a contentment that makes you sing in the pits of a cellar, that makes you trust when you weep over the death of a loved one. This is the gospel truth. Those who are in Christ have joy eternal, untouchable, and incomprehensible to the watching world. That is the second part of this pep talk. That not only is there a heavenly transfer, but there is a coming turnover. But that's not all. Jesus doesn't just leave them there. He gives them a third stanza in this halftime speech. It is this. All in him have direct access to the head coach. Verses 23 and 24. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Let me just clarify this in just the short amount of time that we have. What Jesus is saying here is prior to his death and resurrection, they would ask him things and there would, be, there would need to be access to the Father through Jesus. But Hebrews tells us that Christ's death once and for all, for all who would ever believe, has made access so that we have a finished work. We have a high priest and we have a finished offering so that we can have direct access to the Father. We can come to the throne. We don't go through Jesus, we go in Jesus' name. Have you ever wondered why we close prayers in Jesus' name? It's not some sort of mantra, it's not some sort of chant. We close prayers in Jesus' name because it's according to his righteousness and his works that we have access to the Father. We have direct access to the Father because of the work of Jesus. In fact, every time Jesus references in my name, he is speaking about the time after his death. Every time in the New Testament that Jesus talks about you will do something in my name, it's after the death and resurrection. Because his work has established your position before the Father. So you go to the Father in Jesus' name. We have direct access. Our prayers are to the Father in the Spirit by the power of the Son. And these prayers and the promise of these answered prayers fills our hearts with joy. Notice in the text. Ask and you will receive. Why? Why can we have confidence of this? Why do we know this is not just a blanket check that I go out and I will, whatever I want, I will receive? Because the Lord of glory is too good for that. Just like a good parent will not give a toddler something that's not good for them, no matter how earnestly or repeatedly they ask of it. But he will say, whatever you ask, in my name and according to my will, I will grant it. All the promises that he declares to us, he will bring about. 
And every prayer that is asked in his will will come to pass. And that's why verse 24 says that our joy will be made full. Jesus continues, and he says, I've said these things to you in figures of speech. (laughs) The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. This is just a fun little transition here. Jesus says, I talked to you about figures of speech, but now I'm going to talk to you plainly. And then the disciples say this, ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech, verse 29. Now we know that you know all things and you do, need, you do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. I got it. I was coaching seven and eight-year-old baseball. First practice. Um, I have a group of kids. You can imagine the picture seven and eight-year-old baseball players. And uh, I gather them around. All right, our first instruction is going to be just defensive posture. And so I, I literally, I, I get shoulder width apart and I start to give this. And I have one kid. Uh, his name will be, we'll just call him Cade because that was his name, and he deserves the shame. I'm just saying. He, as soon as I get in this posture, he stands up. I have them all take a knee. He stands up. He goes, Coach, I got this. I said, okay, what, what do you mean you got this? I got this. As in, you don't need to teach me anything. Cade was by far the worst player on our team. <laughs> Hands down. Even to the point that at one point, Cade was due up to bat, and I'm coaching third, and I look over to the on-deck circle, and I go, where's Cade? I don't know. We don't know. Cade is in the parking lot at the ice cream truck ordering an ice cream cone. (laughs) Cade was like, I got this. It's a little bit of the feel we get with the disciples right here. We got you. Okay, you're not using figure of speech anymore. We can can roll with this. We we understand you, so look at Jesus' response, verse 31. Do you now believe? (laughs) It's not outright sarcastic denial, but there is a tacit rebuke in this. Notice what he says. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered. You will be scattered, each one to his own home, and will leave me alone. It doesn't really look like you got it, Peter. It doesn't really look like you've got it, John. It doesn't really look like you've caught on. And I want to pause here and just give you a little bit. This can be helpful as we think through the gospel uh, and sometimes I'm stealing this from a friend, but there is a, a structure when you think about the gospel where we need to come to gospel clarity first and foremost. That means that we understand what the gospel is, meaning the gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament is that all mankind is born in sin. It's in our nature, and if given enough time and opportunity, we manifest it, and it doesn't take long, right? Right? We are sinners by nature, and as sinners against a holy God, we deserve just punishment. And that punishment, we're told from the very beginning, is death, eternal separation from God. We are sinners. That's where we are. That's where we stand. But God, in his great mercy, the gospel, the good news, comes on the backside of that and says that Jesus of Nazareth is actually God in the flesh. And he lived the life that we so miserably fail at. He lived that perfect life. And then instead of taking his righteousness and going home, he dies As a sinner should die, he dies in the place of all who would ever believe. And because he's God, he can bear the wrath of the Father for all who ever believe throughout all time in all fullness. Meaning he can drink to the bottom the the wrath of God. The scripture says to the very dregs. He can drink every ounce of the wrath of God that is due sinners who believe in him. And he does that on the cross. And then he rises from the dead to show his power and to show us that we can have eternal life with the Father just like him. That is the good news. So first and foremost, you need to have clarity that that's what the good news is. The good news is not if you just ask Jesus to sort of come into your heart or be a part of you or or you can just put a bumper sticker on or you can kind of live a moral life that things will go better for you. That is not the gospel. So you need to understand with first the clarity in the gospel, what the gospel actually is. And then two, you need to have gospel conviction. You need to believe that that is. Not only you need to say, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches, but you need to believe that it's true, that Jesus did actually live and die in the place of sinners, and he rose from the dead. But that's not all. You also have to have a gospel commitment. You have to know that that's what the gospel is. You have to believe that that's what 
the gospel is. Like you have to believe the veracity of it. And then you have to commit. You have to say, I, I agree and I will confess Jesus is Lord. I understand and recognize that the gospel says I live as if I'm Lord and that is a terrible way to live. And I have offended my God and I will confess that I am no longer posing as Lord. But I confess, I will say the same thing as God does about me. I will confess Jesus is Lord. And I will believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, which is a summary statement of all the gospel. I will cling to that. When you confess that Jesus is Lord, you are saying, I will follow him. Or to put it in Jesus' words, follow me. That is part and parcel of the gospel. So friends, if you're in here today and you have gospel clarity, I pray that you will grow in gospel conviction. And if you have gospel conviction, I pray that you will have gospel commitment. That you are willing to say, I will live my life as God has called me to live my life. I will follow Christ. That is the good news. Here are the disciples. Jesus is saying, you will. You will have commitment. But be careful. Be careful because what you're saying right now, you don't realize what is coming in the next few hours. And he says this, and this is so sweetly. He says, I'm not telling this to discourage you. Right? Verse 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. And then he gives the final phrase, and this is the final hype. (laughs) Jesus' pep talk is a heavenly transfer, a turnover is coming, direct access to the head coach. And then fourthly, guys, we have the best player. We have the best player. Today, in modern terms, we like to refer to players in their field that we want to argue as the best, and we call them the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And there's all kinds of debates. Who's the GOAT of basketball? Who's the GOAT of football? Who's the GOAT of this sport or that sport? I don't, I don't mean to do this in any way to sort of make it, you know, earthly. Jesus is the greatest of all time. We need to understand that. Jesus is the greatest of all time. And it's not an argument of like, oh, what else somebody? He stands above all. He is Lord of all. He's the greatest of all time. How do you know that? Look back at the text. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. If you can only remember Five words. Let these be the five words. If you leave here today and you can just remember, if you can just internalize that in your battle of tribulation and toil and trials, if you can remember this, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. What an audacious claim before the cross, which appears to be the overthrow of Christ and his kingdom. But in reality, it's the overthrow of Satan, sin, and the world. So I want you to understand Every enemy that threatens you and your life and God's purpose for your life, every enemy is done. It's beaten. It's conquered. So confident is Jesus that he uses the past tense for an event he's about to have. He says, I've overcome the world. And you go, well, not yet. And you go, yeah, I know. Tomorrow. Right? Just give me, give me a few hours. But so confident, so certain is he that he uses the past tense I have conquered, or it's the one Greek word that many of you know and don't know that you know. You wear the apparel. Nike means victor or conqueror. And I'm not here trying to argue for, you know, overseas production or American-made stuff. I can just say this. You're going to see Nike enough that every time you see that swoosh, you can sit there and go, whew, they probably don't mean this when they wear that. But you know what that reminded me of? Jesus has overcome the world. My king has overcome the world. Everything that threatens me, the sinfulness of this world, the sickness of this world, the reality of death, disappointment, vanity, humiliation, shame, guilt, all the forces of the enemy, all that is broken and biting in this world is crushed by a crucified Messiah. He has overcome the world. Such a great truth that for John it became a tagline of believers. In 1 John 2 he said this, Young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And later he said, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. How have they overcome the evil one? Because Christ has overcome the evil one. 
Friends, you don't go out this door in your own strength. If you do, you will fail. But if you go in the strength of Christ, you will stand, no matter what is brought before you. If you are in Christ today, and friends, if you are not, you can be. If you're not in Christ today, if maybe you have gospel clarity, maybe you even have gospel conviction, but you have never said, you know what, I will live my life for his glory. I'm willing to lay down whatever it is, whatever dream it is, whatever relationship it is, whatever aspiration it is, I'm willing to lay down my life so that I can take his and follow him because it's better. If you haven't come to that place, you have that opportunity today. You can say, Lord, I will follow you. I confess my sins and I confess you as Lord and I will follow you no matter what the cost. You can do that today. And if you do that today and you are in Christ today, you are a victor. That's why we used to sing. uh, Maybe we'll resurrect it. Maybe we'll find a a more modern version. We used to sing victory in Jesus, didn't we? My Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. He loved me before I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. So if you're beaten down this morning and you don't feel like your side is winning, here are 11 upset men who will later upset the world. 11 men who would, within hours, abandon Christ. Peter will deny him three times. And yet these same men will rejoice for being beaten and imprisoned and will die a martyr's death with smile on their faces and no regret in their hearts. So don't rush the field today for the gipper. Rush it for the goat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you you are worthy of of every life in this room. You are worthy that every life in this room, every man, every woman, every young boy, every young girl would look to you and run to you. That we would run to you and your mercy, that we would beg for forgiveness, that we would rest in that forgiveness and that we would follow you no matter what the cost. Lord, in your kindness, you have told us in your word that a life apart from that will prove vain, that a life that is successful in this world will only make us disappointed in the end. So, oh, would you not arrest our hearts today? Keep us from pursuing a life that is not centered on you. Help us lay down whatever loves, whatever desires, whatever dreams and follow you because it is through your work that we can have peace it's by your sacrifice that we win and Lord you do indeed reign over all help us worship in Jesus name amen